Hello everybody, welcome to the June 2022 intelligence briefing. And this particular intelligence briefing is sort of special for me, and it's pretty interesting from the global extraterrestrial galactic perspective if you put it into the right frame of mind. So I'm going to be talking about my health and about my age. Now, the reason I have to do this, I do this every five years. Uh, I'm starting um, next month in July. I'm 70 years old, and I know I don't look 70, and I don't act 70, and like nothing is right. And people are asking me, they're emailing in, people are commenting on our forums on YouTube, as well as uh, farsideprime.com, like they're saying, I'm an extraterrestrial. They're, talking, <laughs> they're saying, what is, what is cra it's crazy, it's like not right. Uh, something's wrong, something's different, and I agree, something's not normal. So I'm here to explain that. So I don't really know where to begin, um, except that I am going to tell you for sure when I am going to die. That's right, I'm going to start out by telling you when I am going to die, then I'll explain the whole thing. I am going to die between the year 2062 and 2072, according to the science, it's pretty much certain. 2062 to 2072. That's between 40 to 50 years from now. Now that's really important because that gives me approximately 50 years of active professional life, which is really great. And also my health during that time period is going to be spectacular according to the science. And I'll explain the science in just a little while, but um, Everything is normal. Uh, there's no body problems whatsoever. There are not going to be any body, body problems whatsoever. There will be no mental decay, no Alzheimer, no cancer, no heart disease, no anything until the very end and I'll just collapse and fall over. That's what happens with the mice and the rats and the spiders and everything that they do this that I'm going to explain in a second when they do this to it. I have my health checked on a regular basis because I'm doing something that's very not normal. It's uh, part of an experiment, and it started back in the mid-1980s when there was, I was a professor at UCLA, and at that time there was a professor, um, researcher, medical doctor, who was uh, called Roy Walford. And Roy Walford, in the medical school, I was in Bunch Hall, he was in the medical school, some buildings down. Uh, he was a pioneer in aging research, and what they had found out, what he had found out was that people well, actually, animals, any across all species, when you cut their calories in half, or actually severely restricted their calories, uh, plus you super supplemented, plus you, you gave them many more vitamins and minerals than necessary, that their aging rate was cut in half. And in a human sense, it translated into 120 years. And it was, and it's not in dispute now. The only thing that is in dispute is whether humans can do it. Um, now, I'm going to talk about it and explain it, and then explain why it's really important for the prison planet idea that we've been talking about at Farsight. I'm going to give you the details, and I'm going to tell you uh, some of the side effects that have happened, and some of the things that I've had to do to compensate for those side effects that are not, not health related, but in terms of how you look related. So anyway, so the basic, the basic bottom line is that my health is approximately the same as when I was around 30-ish. Uh, I have my, my son is 29, going to be 30. Um, I have, a, I work, I go through the Emory Healthcare System. Emory is one, Emory University is one of the largest healthcare providers in the United States and one of the absolute most prestigious, and they follow me closely. <laughs> I'm not saying the whole Emory does, but the doctors that I work with at Emory, they follow me really closely. They've been really super great at, um, at sort of helping me along in terms of monitoring, because you can't do what I do unless, unless you have a doctor look at it all along. You have to, doctor has to measure, has to, has to check everything, and I have everything checked. So, and they've been really great. So the doctors that I work with at Emory, they, they know me, they, they know the whole thing that I'm doing, which I'll explain to you in just a little bit. Uh, they know the whole thing that I'm doing and they changed all of, they changed much of what they do based on what 
I'm doing so that they that so that that can be sort of fit all together. All right, so I'm going to be explaining that, and then I'm going to be explaining why. Uh, I'll explain exactly why I'm going to be around until 2072, and why you're going to be looking at my face for 2000 for another 50 years. <laughs> <laughs> and this is also going to be an issue because this, uh, starting this summer, we're going to be releasing some new things. We're going to be filming a lot of stuff um, at outdoors locations, including the beach. So you're going to be seeing me outside and with everybody else at Farsight. And um, it's going to cause a problem when people look and say, that guy's not 70 years old. So we have to, I have to explain this because it's going to get worse. People... I've already had to squash the rumor that I'm an extraterrestrial like four times so far. It was actually growing pretty badly. I had to squash that. No, I'm a human being. But, they, but you are correct. Something's not right. I have, to, I have to explain what that is. So the other thing is, and I have to put this up in, in um, bold print here. I am not giving any health recommendations of what anyone should do. What I have been doing is extremely difficult to do. And I enjoy doing it, but uh, that it's an experiment, and the doctors themselves are, I'm a guinea pig. They're looking at me and saying, whoa, all right, well, so far, so good. But the doctors don't really know. Um, you know, um, they don't, I'm, I'm very, I'm, I'm a surprise to everybody. And the doctors don't really know, they don't have a history. I have been told, and I don't know if this is the case, but I've been told there's about 100,000 people that are doing what I'm doing. But I don't believe it. I've never met one. So I, it's just too difficult to do it. And you, have to, and you have to know what you're doing. And then you have to have doctors sort of follow you along as you do it. But it does, what I'm doing does cut the age rate in half approximately. And so, and I have it all checked and it apparently looks exactly according to what the science does. Now they... The, uh, the scientists themselves are sort of messed up. Scientists aren't so smart. Uh, they make a lot of mistakes. They did the uh, spider studies correctly, the rat studies correctly, they did the snake studies correctly, <laughs> all the lower animals they did. The primate studies they had a problem with. They did two primate studies so far. One was sort of done okay and it did show that the caloric restriction was plus super supplementation does work. But the other one was done so incompetently, I was sort of surprised that the funding agency didn't ask for their money back. It was a crazy way they did it. They super supplemented the, the free eating monkeys and then they actually restricted their diet slightly. And then the, um, the starving monkeys, they gave them sort of a minimum amount of supplementation, the same exact food that the free eating monkeys were eating. And so the free eating monkeys were super supplemented and the starving monkeys were malnourished because the intestines are not 100% efficient so they can't absorb, they don't absorb anything. So if you take a minimum daily a dose vitamin, for example, you're getting maybe, I don't know how much, it's just a guess, maybe 50% of what you're taking in actually is absorbed by the intestines. Now if you're eating freely, then that covers the rest, so you don't need more. But if you're not eating freely and you're under severe caloric restriction, then it, um, and you're only taking a minimum, a dose of, a, of, a, of vitamins, you're going to be malnourished and you're going to be sick and die. So, you know, it's, the, the one primate study was sort of done okay and it did duplicate the results that it works. The, uh, the other primate study was incompetent in my opinion. So, but all the, the, the studies with like the lower animals, the rats, the, mon no, the rats, not the monkeys, but the rats, the, uh, the spiders, the snakes, and all the other things, they were done really quite well. And so the, the whole idea of caloric restriction plus super supplementation is not in dispute anymore. Although when I started it, it was very controversial. Okay, so let's get into the details and then let me explain why this matters with regard to humanity's role in the galaxy. I'm not kidding. We're getting to that. All right? Okay. Now, let's go, the, to start with the details, let me, um, let me say that um, most of you know, if you follow me, uh, because of our work with uh, remote viewing and uh, the scientific experiments that we've been doing with regard to the, to, to the remote viewing, um, 
That's gotten a lot of traction. We're the largest by far remote viewing venue on the planet Earth, anywhere. And uh, we have the most interesting content. We're the only place that has actual public projects. We have started to be shadow banned by both Google and YouTube. So if you do a search for remote viewing for Google and YouTube, uh, you don't find us, which is interesting, which means we're making some type of a dent in the world. If you do any other search engine, such as DuckDuckGo, Yahoo, Bing, whatever, we're always near the top. Um, but that started uh, in last summer, around June of, of 2021, when the U.S. military started to release the UFO uh, stuff, saying that they have sightings that they uh, can't explain. They're not Russian, they're not Chinese, they're not us, but we're not saying they're aliens. But they're, And they started showing the so-called Tic Tac video and stuff like that. So that was the time that the shadow banning actually got started. So anyway, um, uh, we are making a dent. And so you have to understand that I've been at this stuff, working on this stuff with remote viewing for a very long time. And I have had opponents. I've had lots of opponents. So many of them, you know, in, in the academy, meaning in the university settings as well. But there's a Jewish saying that really fits well. And you have to say it with a shrug. And it goes like this. You just have to live long enough. <laughs> <laughs> that's the Jewish saying that's really great. You just have to live long enough. Meaning if you live long enough, then your opponents, they die off and then you're still standing. So part of the reason I do the caloric restriction plus the super supplementation is I'm a scientist. I saw it. It wasn't just to live well. I knew that this is going to be a long battle. And I said, well, I want to be around. And like the Jewish saying says, you just have to live long enough. <laughs> okay. All right. So, um, I started this thing about, and again, let me emphasize, I am recommending that nobody else do what I do. It's this, I'm not a medical doctor. I have, I have not given any recommendations on what people should do. I'm just telling you what I'm doing. And I'll even go through all the supplements. And I'll give you, a, a, and, I'll give you and I'll give you something that you're going to see later. The caloric restriction has a severe impact on how you look. And so if you're a rat, well, you're covered with fur. What does it matter? No one's going to, the rats don't look at themselves in a mirror and they're covered with fur anyway. If you're a snake, you're covered with scales and no one notices. And great snakes don't look in mirrors anyway. But if you're a human being, we're naked. We don't have any fur or scales on us. And uh, this process of super supplementation with the caloric restriction it makes you look like you just came out of a famine. I mean, all the fat drains from the face. It looks, you look absolutely horrible. So plastic surgery is a mandatory component of this. If you don't do that, some type of plastic surgery to uh, make the face especially, you can be thin on the body. That's okay. A lot of people are thin and lanky. I do the normal stuff that, a 20, that people in their 20s and 30s do, surfing, jogging, all the sports, and stuff like that. Um, but if you look like hell every time you wake up in the morning and you look yourself in the mirror and you look like you're going to die because all the fat drains from your face, and I'm going to show you before and after pictures, you just say, my gosh, I'm going to die. Look at the way this thing looks. And then also you really can't, um, you can't do the stuff it got so bad for me. The body was doing well. The medical stuff was all coming in. Everything was going perfect. I had a good friend of mine, a colleague in the, my, at my university, actually come to my house years and years ago and ask if I was dying of AIDS. <laughs> I was so emaciated looking. And you, what, you know, I said, no, I'm actually in great health. I don't have any diseases whatsoever. But I looked so bad that he actually came to my house and asked me if I was dying of AIDS. So it has an effect on how you look. Again, if you're a rat, you're covered with fur, no one will notice. If you're a snake, you're covered with scales, no one will notice. But if you're a human, you're naked and people will notice. So I'm going to go through what I had to do with regard to plastic surgery in order to fix that. Because what does it matter if you lived 120 years old, if you look like crap? And then you can't do anything because people think you're going to die all the time when in fact you're really healthy. So you have to deal with that. It's not an optional thing. It's a mandatory thing. And then there's a stigma, and it's a stupid stigma, but it's a stigma in, uh, for men not to have plastic surgery. But in fact, they have to if they're doing this thing 
to recover what they lost by doing that thing. The caloric restriction really severely affects the way you look, so you have to do something to compensate for that. All right, so, um, and again, I'm not recommending that anybody do what I do. In fact, if you do what I do, there's probably a high chance that you will die. Uh, it has to be done so carefully and under such good controls that, um, and, and also I've had really great doctors that have understood what I've did, including the plastic surgeons I went to. Um, they were Emory plastic surgeons. Uh, they, they, they still work at Emory facilities. Uh, the uh, plastic surgeons I, I've used, in fact, they, they have a private practice now at, um, that still works out of Emory facilities. Uh, uh, M -E, M E plastic surgery, that stands for M E like M like me, but that stands for Myoto and, and uh, Eves. Uh, the, it's a, and they have, been, they have gone through them all, my, my medical records at Emory, they understood. And when I actually went to them, I went to Dr. Eves first, and I told him what I was, what I was doing. And he looked through all my records and said, okay, we see what you're doing. I understand, and it seems to be working, you're doing great. Uh, and then he says, you want what now? I said, I, you need to fix this so that I look okay. I just have to look normal. I mean, the body can be very healthy, but I have to look okay. And he literally said to me, Courtney, you know, you're asking a lot of us. <laughs> we do a lot of things, but you're asking to reverse this. And he said, okay, we'll start, we'll do it, but it's going to take a while. We're going to have to do this in stages because you're asking us to fix something that you did to yourself, which is to remove all the fat. And you're talking how to, we're talking to fix that so you look like a healthy, normal person. Okay, but just understand this is going to, this is not going to be a one-time thing. You're going to, so I have gone, you know, a bunch of steps and I'm going to show you pictures, uh, videos, in fact, uh, what it's been like all along the way to sort of fix that. So basically, the caloric restriction works well uh, for me, plus the super supplementation, so I'm not malnourished in any way, shape, or form. But um, there are some things it can't fix. Uh, it, can't, it can't fix the, the way you look, and it also can't fix sun damage. So if there's sun damage from being exposed to the sun, whenever I see people lying out in the pool and being exposed to the sun and sun tanning, I'm just saying, boy, are they going to be regretting that in a few years. So, but they can't, and I, I go to Africa a lot, so I've been in the sun a lot. So I, it doesn't, caloric restriction can't undo that. So other things I had to do to undo that, to get rid of all the skin that was sun damaged. But anyway, um, the caloric restriction does uh, stop everything else in terms of internal stuff, including mental decay, Alzheimer's, stuff like that. And people have commented that when they see me talking, it's like the vibrancy is there and I'm talking like a young person and that's a consequence of, um, of the caloric restriction as well. There's no mental decay. So anyway, um, all right. So, and I've already covered that Dr. Roy Walford, you can look him up, you can Google him or something. Uh, he and I differed a little bit First of all, he didn't, I, I, I changed the, the stuff he was doing and his stuff. Um, I vegetarianized it because I was a vegetarian. And he actually supported the idea of having a little bit more oil in the diet and I didn't agree with that. Um, the oil in the diet, you don't, he was arguing that the oil was necessary to convey some vitamins, but I argued that there's enough oil in other things like in some nuts and things like that to convey those vitamins. So there's not a big problem with that. And he also, said, he also thought that you could do this to an extreme. You could push it to the absolute limit where there's absolutely no fat left in the body. And if you do a Google on Roy Walford, uh, that's W-A-L-F-O-R-D, you'll see pictures because he did it to himself as well. And he pushed it to the absolute limit. And he looked awful at the end. And he, only, he died at the age of 79, and I knew that was coming. So that was not a surprise. Uh, and the reason is he pushed it so much, the body started to eat itself. And he had a genetic thing. He probably still would be alive today if he didn't push it to such an extreme. So you have to, be, it, it's, it's something where it can be pushed to a level, but there has to be like a 10%, a 10% cushion 
if you push it to the level where there's absolutely no fat left at all, the body starts eating itself. So it, it can be taken to uh, you know, a great distance, but you can't push it as far as he pushed it. And if you see pictures of him on the net where he did it, I mean, he looks awful. I mean, just absolutely awful. Near the end, he just pushed it way too far. Okay, um, he was also the doctor in the Earth 2, the Biosphere 2 experiments that went on in the domes in Arizona. That was very interesting. He was the doctor in, in that thing. Also, this thing couldn't be started till the age of 30. If uh, this thing is done before the age of 30, uh, well, women can't give birth. It, it, they, the shock is such an extreme shock to the system that the, uh, they don't ovulate any longer. So they have to make sure they've had their babies before they do this, if they do something like this. And, uh, and people can't do it when they're in their 20s because they stop growing, literally the height. Even after you get to be like 18, 19 years old, there's still a little growth that's occurring. And um, that doesn't happen uh, if, if, if this thing... If, uh, if this caloric restriction thing goes on. Okay, um, just to give a, one last thing I want to say. Last time I did this, uh, it was 2018, so this is not quite five years, it's, but it's, I'm, I'm trying to do this every five years. And since I'll be 70 next month, I just figured this is close. So um, there are a lot of people that, after I did it the last time, they put in posts in the YouTube and other things for recommendations of things to do. Uh, this type of supplement, that type of supplement. Folks, that stuff, either it doesn't work or it, it's, it's very controversial or the research is not in. Don't believe anything you hear from anybody. The only thing that they absolutely know works for reducing the age, aging rate is to pull the, f the fuel out of the fire. You see, the, the body, the reason you have a warm temperature is the body is a furnace. It burns sugars, it burns fuel, and that's why you get warm. And then, it, in, in like any furnace, it, it burns itself up doing all that. It has to take the food, it has to process the food, it has to uh, d digest and store the food, especially if there's too much food, you have to store it in fat. It takes an enormous amount of energy just to process all that. So if you don't have that much food going through the system, the body doesn't do that. And so it doesn't burn itself out processing the food. That's the basic theory behind it. There are some doctors who think there's that other theory that it triggers a genetic switch, that sort of the famine switch and so the, the genes actually change in some way to, um, pre to make preservation longer. Uh, they're still researching, but the fact that it does actually work uh, is different from the question of why it works. They're still working on why it works. And there are some people who are working on other th things, such as supplements. The basic idea behind the people who are pushing supplements, so these are special supplements, is that it's just too damn hard to do this caloric restriction. I haven't had a pizza, a cheese pizza, since the early 1980s. I don't remember what it tastes like. I don't even remember what a piece of cake tastes like. So uh, all of these things that you normally consider food, I'm, I can't eat out because I can't, when, they, when people cook things, when you eat out, you go to a Chinese restaurant or something, they add oil to the food and stuff. I can't eat any of that stuff. So it's very, it's very challenging to do this kind of thing. So um, it's uh, not many people do it. I, again, I've never met somebody who did do it. But I am a, an object of interest at the, <laughs> with my doctors. <laughs> they think it's going really interesting. Although none of the doctors have told me that they're going to do it themselves. Uh, my son has said he's going to be doing it. He's actually starting it because uh, he grew up with me. And he's seen the difference. He sees the fathers of his friends when he was growing up, and he saw what happened to them, and he sees me. And he says, whoa, Dad, <laughs> I'm, I'm not going that way, I'm going your way. So he's doing the same thing. Um, Princess is talking about it, I don't know if she'll actually do it, but she's talking about it, because she's seen me long enough to, to know this type of stuff. All right, um, in terms of uh, physical stuff, let me also just say that my, in terms of physical fitness, it hasn't affected me at all. I jog um, 4.28 4 
miles uh, every other day. Um, about four, a little more than four miles at, uh, every other day, or so over six kilometers every other day. Uh, religiously, um, the same exact way I was doing it when I was 30. There's no f difference whatsoever. Um, so, and I, you know, do all the sports. And surfing is considered an extreme sport. I love surfing. You find a 70-year-old who does surfing. And <laughs> but like, I don't, that does, none of that makes any sense to me. That, because I just sort of feel, I, I feel great, so I go out and jump on the surfboard. All right, so, um, all right, so let me actually go into a little bit of, again, about what the plastic surgeons did, because I want to show the side effects of this before I get into uh, basically what I did. So I want to actually, I want you to show, I want to show you why so few people would want to do this and why plastic surg surgery is mandatory. So what I am going to do is I'm going to show you before and after pictures right before I actually started this. This is when I went to uh, Dr. Eves and his wife is uh, Dr. Miodo, and um, she's been the one who's been working with me more recently. But uh, to get my face the way it looks now, they did something called fat grafting. Now what that means is they had to pull fat. I did have a little bit of fat tucked in nooks and crannies around the body and they literally had to search. I had to, I had to be stark naked and they had to search for where they had little pockets. <laughs> Of that. And they found those little pockets and they put marks all over my body and they sucked those out with like liposuction while I was under general anesthesia and they pumped them in and they took the fat and they pumped it into the face. Now immediately after they do it, I look like a balloon. I look like a bubble head and it looks horrible. But within a few days it sort of shrinks down. Now you lose mm, 50, 40, 40 to 50% 50 of the fat that they pump in, so you have to do it in stages. You, you, you take the fat, you pump it in, it blows up, shrinks. Then you see what's left. Then you do it again, take some fat, pump it in the face, it shrinks, then you see what's left. So I had it done four times. And um, the nurses after the second time said, you're not doing this again, Courtney. There ain't no fat left in your body. But I searched and searched and I found little nooks and crannies and I went back to the doctors and I said, I think we have a little bit here. Can we? And so they pulled out everything that was left. And after fourth time, the doctors themselves said, there is no fat left, Courtney. So <laughs> you have to just, this is it. But I'm, they, they did it. So it was, it was pump, shrink, pump, shrink, pump, shrink, pump, shrink. And finally, after four times, my face looked pretty normal. All right, so let me give you an idea of what actually it happens so that when you see me, uh, you'll get an idea of what I would have looked like or what I would look like if I didn't, if why, why plastic surgery is absolutely mandatory. So let's see if I can do this now. Yes, okay, great, okay. All right, so on the, on the far right, you see 2018. So that's what I went, when I went to Dr. Eves, and uh, that's what I sort of looked like. And then, um, in 2021, that was after two pumps of fat going into the face. And then 2022 was the last and final. Uh, that, that's when they said, there ain't no fat left, Courtney. That's, that's it. Me without it. And you can see the, the sunken eyes, the stuff under the eyes and the sunken, uh, you know, and the cheeks and stuff like that. And then if you go on the far left, that was after two pumps. Of the, of, and then the 2022 was after the final one. And the doctors and I were pretty happy. They said, okay, that's good enough. So um, anyway, so um, anyway, so that was, that was going on. I'll let this play to the end. Now I took the 2018 off. Uh, so, all right. So I took out the two, and this is the 2021 and the 2000. 22. Well, 2022, you don't need because I'm, I'm here. I have to say also that um, stress is, uh, is, is going to kill you if there's, if there's anything that's going to kill you. So uh, I, this had to be, um, someone said, why, did you, why, do you, why do you do this, Courtney? <laughs> okay. All right. So th uh, this stress if, if you're putting yourself under psychological stress as well as physical stress, uh, that will kill you. So this whole caloric restriction thing had to happen slowly. I had to do it over a period of four years to sort of slowly ease into it. 
that was doc, that was what Dr. Roy Walford was saying. I had to go in for four years, and I took that at point at face value. And then there was the um, the issue of uh, of uh, how you look, the stress of how you look. So, and again, I had. Uh, when people started to ask me if I was, I was so skinny and so thin that I was, they asked if I was uh, dying of AIDS, that was, that was the last straw. I said, I just have to deal with this. All right, so if you're going to live long, uh, there has to be a reason for it. Now, this gets to the extraterrestrial stuff that I told you we were going to get to. So please listen to this. You're not supposed to die at 60, 65, 70, 75. That's not supposed to happen. I know that mainstream science isn't here yet, but this is what we've been figuring out at, at Farsight. The genetics of humans are specifically designed to function within a prison planet system. They have designed the human body to, there's been all types of genetic manipulation, and they've designed the human body to die early. The reason is, if you live long enough, you'll have a chance to figure out how to get out of the system, how to collapse the system, and that wasn't supposed to happen. So part of the prison planet idea is to keep the prisoners prisoners by not giving them a chance to figure out what's going on. So for myself, I said, well, I wanna, once I realized that, that it was gonna take me a long time to sort of figure out what's going on and to devise a, a plan to do things, uh, I realized I, I had to live a long time to do this. When I started doing my research into remote viewing, it had a tremendous impact on my professional career. I was an academic who was a star. I was a mathematical modeler. I was up and coming. I mean, everyone thought I was amazing. I did all types of nonlinear mathematical modeling. I was getting published repeatedly in the leading places. And then I came out with the stuff on extraterrestrials and remote viewing, and it was like a, a nuclear bomb hit my career. Uh, I had trouble publishing things. I had trouble getting people to take my work seriously. So I then realized, well, the only way I'm going to win this is to, if I c couldn't get published in the normal academic journals easily, then the only way I'm going to win this is to change the, the environment the, so that, and, and academics are the last people to change. They're extremely conservative. So the whole planet's going to accept that extraterrestrials are real before the academics accept that extraterrestrials are real or that remote viewing is real. I mean, they're going to be the, the academics going to be the last, they're the last car to go through the tunnel. And so I said, okay, I'm going to have to start, you know, teaching how this is done. So not just teaching remote viewing, but teaching humanity how this is done. So I had to learn web programming. Then I had to publish my own books. I had to publish my book on remote viewing, The Science and Theory of Non-Physical Perception. So I had to create a publishing venue, a publishing house, the printer, that would sell books on Amazon and uh, stores. And then it became that the video became the main means of transmitting information. People don't read anymore. I read, I love to read, but you know, most people get their information from videos. So I had to learn how to do movies. But then, um, selling movies on a one-time basis or on YouTube, they were just not, I was, I had a big audience for the New Age community, but for the purposes of changing the planet, it just wasn't enough. So I had to learn how to do a streaming service. The streaming service, our farsightprime.com, you can thank Aziz, my son, he's the one who pushed it. He said, Dad, it's amazing how you learned how to do the videos, but really we need we need, everyone's going to the streaming service. So I said, well, Vimeo's been talking to me about that. And, they, and he said, Dad, you're gonna call them up and you're gonna talk to them about it. So that's when we started the streaming service. If it wasn't for Aziz, I wouldn't have done it. So, but that's, so I had to learn how to become the CEO of something that's equivalent to Hulu or Netflix or something like that. Academics don't know how to do that kind of stuff. They don't know how to create their own publishing house. They don't know how to create movies. They don't know anything about how to make movies. I mean, you do get academics that know how to make movies, but they're usually taking their movies, they do two or three in a lifetime, and they take them to film festivals and stuff like that. But I had to learn how to do it so that mass audiences would be able to look at them, like YouTube and, and now uh, our own farsightprime.com, our own streaming service. That's really alien to the academic environment. 
And it was only that way, however, that I can convince the, you know, the large portion of humanity that this type of thing is real, and then slowly uh, can, you know, you know, tip the corner in terms of changing the way the world works. So I have academic books that I am actually in the process of writing, but I'm waiting until the environment is correct before I actually publish them. Okay, <clears throat> the other thing, by the way, I, I should say something with regard to my diet. The other thing I changed, uh, Roy Walford was not doing this, but I felt it was important, is I went not only vegetarian and I took almost all oil out of the diet, but um, I, uh, I did, um, I changed everything to organic because with organic food, inorganic food will not kill you. If you eat it, you'll be okay. But the small insults to the body with inorganic food, they make a difference over time. And um, eventually they have an impact. So they won't kill you tomorrow, but the eventually I just didn't think it was a good idea, especially if I'm eating so little, the pesticides and herbicides would have a bigger effect. Um, so I said, okay, I'm just going organic on everything. So um, that, was, that was a big deal. Also, by taking away almost all the oil, I was able to eat more bulk. Um, so having bulky food that fills the stomach is an important psychological component. For example, I eat oatmeal with a lot of fruit and almond milk in the morning. And I eat enough that I'm sort of uncomfortable because I fill my stomach. But it has almost no calories because there's no butter in it. The, the, the milk has is, is, uh, got almost no calories in it. And um, I cook the oatmeal in skim milk, organic skim milk, of course, and so that there's no fat in it in that way. So it's highly nutritious and fills the stomach but has very few calories. And I do that. And that way I can last till the evening because I remember how I was feeling stuffed in the morning. So there's a psychological component. The other thing I did that Roy Walford uh, didn't seem to go into was I meditate. So I, 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 I meditate about two and a half hours a day um, and uh, it shuts the body down a lot. It like shuts it down. I have biofeedback machines that I sometimes connect and they like turn off. <laughs> so, uh, you know, like it's not there. And when I go into the hospital to get a physical or something like that, they always hook like the monitors up and they start beeping, deep, 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 because they think I'm dying. Because my heart rate is like uh, 50s, 40s, between 50 and 40. Uh, if I'm sort of excited, it goes up to 60. <laughs> when I'm jogging, it goes up to 140. My blood pressure, I have no med I take no medication at all, and uh, my blood pressure is between, uh, well, it depends. If I just come out of driving across town, it goes up to 127, but it's typically around 120 to, one, to, to 60, 120 to 60, and that's with no blood pressure medication whatsoever at all. Um, libido is the exact same as when I was 30. Sex drive is the exact same. Everything works. I have no need for, nor do I have a desire to use or there's no need for anything like Cialis or Viagra. Everything works. Uh, the mind is still very much 30-ish in that sense. And so that's, um, you know, so the, it, seems to, it does seem to do everything that the science said it would do. When they looked at the rats that they were studying, they noticed that the rats who were the equivalent of 120 years old for a human Rats don't live that long, of course, so when you double their lifespan, you have to translate that into what that would be for a human. And um, the male rats were still running around at 120 years old and having sex with the lady rats. So I thought that was a great thing. <laughs> anyway, so that was, uh, so everything is sort of normal uh, on that end. All right, so um, now I want to cover the question of uh, why I do this, uh, that someone asked in the chat. And um, the, the reason is twofold. First, I wanted to have a longer professional life. Think of the professional life that most people have. After you finish your education, you start working, I mean, you're really 30 years old before everything, you get your PhD or whatever, around 30 years old. And then at the age of 55, you're sort of starting to wind things down, looking for projects to top things off. So that's 25 years after that. And then 60, you're planning on retiring stuff, and 65, you're planning on retiring. 
you're getting you're getting close to retirement. Okay, so if you start at 30 and then go to 55, you're talking 25 years of sort of real active push hard professional life. And then things start to slow down, okay? So you're talking 25, 30 years max in terms of professional push. And most people's professional push is less than that. So if you think of me, I've already had that time period and I never had the slowdown period. So I'm 70 now. So if you start at 30 to go to 70, I've had 40 years of professional push and it's still going. And I've got at least 40, maybe 50 years to go. So if you consider like the most, most people have a 25 to 30 year professional push and you're looking at me, um, so you're talking from 30 till 120, 80, 90 years of professional push. I mean, that means 80 to 90 years of being able to push the same thing. That puts you sort of in the same realm as the lifespan of an extraterrestrial. We seem to be able to think that extraterrestrials live, um, I would say on average, circa something like 150 years old. They, some of them are very advanced. Um, some of the reptilians, for example, seem to be able to keep their bodies going indefinitely. They're not um, just their normal bodies. There's all types of... Uh, extra stuff added to them. They're not just biological beings. Just as biological, normal biological beings, they would die off like everybody else. But they've got all types of other things. Their telepathy, their neural engagement capabilities are technologically enhanced. They have stuff in their blood. I mean, this is, they're just not normal. They, you're talking about an advanced level of technology that is gotten after a million years. And so, and, and similarly, other species, they seem to last a long time. So the far side studies seem to suggest that the humanity is specifically designed to end quickly. And the easy way to do that was just simply to speed up the metabolism rate so that you burn the body out after 50, 60, 70 years. So that's why the caloric restriction works. It stops that process from happening. Extraterrestrials, if you, um, a lot of people in the abduction realm have uh, reported that they actually feel cold uh, you know, physically cold. Their body temperatures are lower. They don't burn their stuff out like uh, uh, like like humans do. All right. So um, the other thing is you ha you have to be doing this for a reason. I haven't covered all the reasons why I'm doing this, but you can't do it for aesthetics purposes. That's why I showed you the before and after pictures because if you're trying to look good and you do the caloric restriction, you're going down the wrong path. <laughs> it doesn't make you look good. And you have to have the money to be able to do the uh, plastic surgery to fix those things. There's other things that the caloric restriction can't do, and I'm coming to the things of the other reasons why I do it in terms of the, the mission, the Farsight mission. It can't stop certain things from happening. It does stop cancers. It does, it, cancers don't form. Uh, heart disease doesn't form. There's no problem in that realm. But it doesn't stop things like... Um, it doesn't stop graying of the hair because those hair is rapidly dividing cells and they just wear out because they're rapidly dividing, dividing, dividing. Now they don't really know the answer to this one, but I, I wouldn't trust sperms from someone who's, um, typically people who are older run a risk of having children who have autism or something like that. Um, and sperm cells, there was a rapidly dividing. So that may have nothing to do with caloric restriction. So the, the healthiest sperm cells seem to come from young people that, and the cells have been um, dividing less often. So that's the same with hair. So I, I, caloric restriction, they don't know what, what the effect it would have on sperm. So that's another question. Like someone who's, a, someone who's 80 or 90 years old maybe shouldn't have a kid with their own sperms because they may be fine but they just the research isn't in. Also it doesn't stop things like the prostate. The prostate is the only organ in the human body, the male human body, that continues to grow. It's like a fingernail or it's like hair. It just keeps growing. Now your heart will stop growing, 
your liver will stop growing, the lungs will stop growing, everything will grow to its normal size and then stop growing. The prostate doesn't stop growing for reasons I, they don't really fully understand, but it doesn't stop growing. So no matter what, it's gonna keep on growing. Now the urethra goes right through the middle of the prostate. So eventually the prostate will shut it off and then they need to do something to open that up. And a lot of people um, take medications that essentially um, shuts off the testosterone and that seems to alleviate uh, that problem. However, that was not something that I wanted to do because I shutting off the t testosterone is something that affects your libido, your sex drive and everything. And I didn't want to have anything like that affecting me, any chemicals. So I had to go in for a surgical approach to it. So again, I went to the Emory doctors and I had two things done. And they, uh, the first thing they did was prostatic embolization. And that was uh, Dr. Dr. Berku, he was a genius at this type of thing. Anyway, that's where they actually, true story. I was awake to the whole thing. I don't like sedation for these things. So they stuck a needle, a tube into my arm, into the vein, and it, went, it, it snaked into the body, all the way through the trunk of the body, into the bottom where the testicles are, near the prostate, to both sides of the prostate, going back and forth, both sides. <laughs> and then they inject these, uh, this blocking stuff that sort of blocks off um, uh, blood vessels going into the prostate, and that kills off a certain amount of the prostate, so the prostate just shrinks. And there's no side effects to that. It doesn't affect uh, it doesn't affect the way the ejaculation works. It doesn't affect uh, the way the urine works or anything. It just, it, I mean, well, it does affect the urine because the prostate shrinks and then you can pee again. But typically people, I found that I needed a second procedure after that because it shrinks the overall size of the prostate, but it doesn't necessarily address the prostate that's right next to and surrounding the urethra. So I had another procedure done called the Resume, R-E-Z-U-M, uh, with another Emory doctor, Dr. Aaron Weiss, and he's brilliant also. And that's where they stick something into the prostate um, and they, uh, uh, it goes up through the urethra and <laughs> into the prostate and they inject steam, not, that's not a joke, boiling steam into the prostate right around the ure urethra and that kills off the prostate area that's right around the urethra. And those two things are like perfect for me. Um, they have no side effects at all. They don't cause any type of uh, ejaculation issues. They don't cause any type of problems. And uh, so it shrinks the size of the prostate. Now the one thing that you have to, that you can measure is something called the PSA. And that's a test for uh, prostates. And PSA for people 70 is typically, you know, pretty high-ish. Sometimes I've seen them on people like 12, 10, things like that. Um, for someone who's um, 50, 40, something like that, the PSA, because the prostate is smaller, it's typically around 100. So my PSA is uh, 0.82. That was the most recent one that was taken just some, a few months ago. So 0.82 means the prostate is sufficiently shrunk that it's the size of a 30-year-old prostate. So, I mean, so the caloric restriction doesn't solve all those things. You have, to, you have to have absolutely everything checked. And then my doctors were good enough that they knew what I was doing. And um, I said, look, I'm gonna be around for a long time, so I don't wanna take any medication or anything. This has gotta be fixed surgically. So they went in, they did what needed to be done surgically. Okay, so now let's go and answer the question that someone's been asking, which is why do all of this stuff? No, you're not, I'm looking at the comments, you're not steaming the, the testicles, you're steaming the prostate. It goes in and it, it's all numbed up, they numb it anyway. They put uh, the steam, it goes in with like, there's, a, <laughs> there's a, a tube that goes in through the urethra and then it has needles that go in sideways and it goes into the prostate and then they put the steam into the prostate and it kills off the prostate stuff right next to the urethra. And I chose that one because it was the most natural, holistic, uh, organic water, whatever. <laughs> I don't know. But it was, a, it was a natural method and com combined with the prostatic embolization, uh, that sort of, that was perfect. But you see, there, there are things that do happen that you have to sort of compensate for. 
that caloric restriction just doesn't do, and the size of the prostate is one of those things. Okay, so why did I do this? Uh, once I started to realize that, that the extraterrestrials were there doing things, that the remote viewing is a very important thing because all the people in the abduction in the realm, the abduction research, everybody says the same thing, that the extraterrestrials and telepathy and remote viewing is normal for them. It's only humans that think it's an abnormal thing and it's, they're even you know, questioning whether it possibly could exist. So the fact that you do see Farsight remote viewers doing things like this, that's normal for the galaxy. It's only humans that look at that as if it's crazy, as if it's not normal. But that's very normal for people in the, in the galaxy. So um, the very fact that the, that the mainstream is now starting to acknowledge that, and the military is kicking them, trying to get them to acknowledge that the UFOs are real. I've been in the rooms with like generals, admirals, generals, things like that, and people ask questions like, why are academics so slow in recognizing these things? And I've actually seen generals look down and just sort of shake their head like they can't figure out what the heck's wrong with academics, <laughs> why they're so slow. Because here, and here's the military, the military is stuck because it can't reveal everything be without a political decision being made. So somehow the politics has to work out. But the military, is, they're, not, they're not flinching. I mean, they know this stuff is, is real. So the very fact that they, and they're, they're releasing videos and they're releasing reports, now thousands of pages of reports are now going to Congress and the military. I, I don't know if you're keeping up with it, but it's more, almost every other month, more stuff is coming out. Official stuff from the military. Well, that is uh, a big deal because the military is trying to, you know, egg people on so that they can, well, not egg them on, but to push them on so that they can finally recognize this stuff. Politicians are not going to do this by themselves. You have to convince the populace that the stuff is real, and then the politicians will follow. And then the last people who will finally agree will be the academics. <laughs> That's the way it's going to work. Okay. All right. So uh, I also so the so the plastic surgery, as far as I'm concerned, is an absolute mandatory component of this. And the most important thing that I had done of everything was the fat grafting, put the fat back in. And the other thing I had done was sun damage. I had to have the sun damaged skin taken off of my skin, and that had nothing to do with caloric restriction. That's because I walk around in Africa a lot. Now, when I walk around in Africa now, and I do. I use an umbrella. I have an umbrella that has like a reflective thing and I walk around in the sun with the umbrella and that keeps the sun off of me. So, but uh, those, the, the sun damaged skin, that was, that was painful. I had to have that stuff boiled off with uh, TCA peels, trichloro, tri, trichloric acidic acids, um, just basically TCA peels and they are painful. And um, anyway, so, um, Let's go now to the main reasons before we close up. We have a few minutes left of uh, why are we doing this. Unless some people do this, and myself, I include myself, you won't be around long enough, or I won't be around long enough in order to finish the job. If you had cut my career off at 55, I had barely just started this stuff. I may have come out with one book in remote viewing like Cosmic Voyage or, or Cosmic Explorers. That was the second book, and that would have been it. That's it. That wasn't enough to do anything serious. So a lot of stuff had to be done that needed more time. And it took me a long time to get to the point where I could take the remote viewing seriously. I had to finish my PhD. I had to get an academic job. I had to get tenure. Then I had to be exposed to the remote viewing. I had to understand this whole process. That took decades. And then if you add a couple years afterwards for a few books, you're done. So that wasn't going to work. So after doing all of that, I needed a number of decades, like five of them or seven of them or eight of them in order to complete doing this stuff out, to fill it out. So in terms of the professional life, that's why the caloric restriction stuff was important to me, because it was the only method known at the time, and it's still to this day the only method that's, that's, that is absolutely known to work. 
Uh, it's very difficult to do and I also don't recommend other people doing it because it's too easy for other people to be psychologically unbalanced with it and go in the anorexic direction and then uh, die. So I really tell people don't do what I do but I'm here to explain what I do so that people can follow what I am doing and understand because we're, we're doing a lot of filming for example this summer in locations various things and you're going to see me out there with all the other Farsight people doing things out there and, uh, and, and everything from bathing suits and everything it's, you're, it's, people are going to start raising questions like what the heck is going on so I had to sort of cut nip it at the bud and sort of explain what's going on especially when you see sort of me in those other other realms and that will continue for the next four or five decades <laughs> so, so anyway um, uh, that's so basically the the other reason why I'm doing that is is because I need a longer professional life to do this uh, and the other reason that it was Im important to do this is because the the capabilities that I have now are much greater in terms of resources than the capabilities that I had 20, 30 years ago. So now I have a streaming service. It's working. Everything's going great. I now know how to do movies really pretty well. And now we're able to expand and do new types of stuff. But like I didn't know how to do all of that before and I didn't and even if I did know how to do it I didn't have the resources to do it but now we have great cameras we have the studios we have studios we have, I'm in a studio right now this is a studio studio we have the light board here we have green screen we have other things so we have we have the I have the physical resources to do things that I didn't have before and so if I were and I had to and nobody actually was coming in to give us those stuff like immediately so this stuff had to be developed over time. So once I had this stuff, then I needed the decades later, like four or five decades later from now, to do stuff with those things. So that's, that's, that's uh, in order to make a difference. Look, if this is really a prison planet that's being operated by malevolent extraterrestrials and the good extraterrestrials are trying to come in and try to break this up, they're giving help to us and some others to sort of stop this prison planet, from doing what it's doing and actually to free everybody, um, that that's a lot of that's a lot to ask of people. And if you're asking that of people who live short lives and only have 20, 25 years of professional life to do anything, what? <laughs> so I had to do the, the this thing because it was at the time the only way known to extend the lifetime in a significant way, not by adding three or four years, but by adding four or five decades to a normal life and to have no degradation of the health or the mental capabilities um, during that entire time. That was really important. It doesn't so much matter if you live long if, you're, you know, if, you're, if the mind's not there also. So everything has to be working okay and this was the only way that was known. So for me this was something that I was able to handle and uh, I also had, uh, fortunately, I had great doctors I could work with who actually had an interest in what I was doing. So I think I'm probably the only person in the entire Emory healthcare system. Emory is one of the most prestigious healthcare systems in the entire planet. Uh, and um, it's one of the largest also in the, in the Southeast. And I think I'm the only person in the entire healthcare system that uh, has done this. So uh, I'm a sort of a, a guinea pig, but the doctors are really happy when I go and they sort of had Courtney your back and <laughs> they like hearing my stories. But anyway, uh, so it's been very, very, very successful. Okay, so uh, the last thing I want to say for why I did it, uh, so I've covered the idea of I had to live long enough to uh, outlive my opponents. <laughs> I had to live long enough in order to f figure out things and then I had to live long enough in order to acquire the resources to do things while I was figuring out things such as the movie business, the uh, having the other resources to, uh, to, to, to literally create things such as movies that would actually change the world in a better way. 
But the final reason why I did this is because it's just been damn fun. <laughs> I got over the missing of tastes. My food that I cook myself every day tastes like crap. <laughs> it's, I, don't really, I don't really spend a lot of time fixing it. I just, and sometimes I eat it in pieces. Like sometimes I'll cook some tofu up and I'll eat the tofu and I'll, then I'll, sometime later I'll fix a salad or something and I'll, so, but I don't like have a whole meal where everything is like put together and sit down. I just sort of, sort of, my food isn't like, so I gave that whole thing up, the whole idea of the taste, sensory stuff. And I also gave up the idea of going out with people to eat at restaurants. I don't do that. So, uh, you know, so you have to say, well, what did I gain by that? Well, I still interact with people a lot, but I interact with people talking with them and doing things. And I do go to clubs, but I don't go to clubs and eat. I, I you know, I go there to talk with people and I go, you know, uh, to the beach and surf and stuff like that. And, that's just for me worth a lot more than a pizza. So I've been really enjoying myself and I enjoy the fact that my my physical life and my mental life is indistinguishable as far as I can see from when I was 30s, including libido and everything else. I enjoy the fact that that's more fun than a pizza or a piece of cake. But I have spoken to lots of people, including some doctors, and uh, inevitably, well, the doctors normally just stay quiet, but most everybody else I've ever talked to, I don't try to ever convince them to do this, but as soon as I start going through what I do, almost inevitably they say, oh, well, I'm not going to do that. I'm not giving up pizza, or I'm not giving up cake, or I'm not doing this. <laughs> I say, yeah, 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 that's right. You don't want to give up that stuff. But for me, it was uh, well worth it. I'm having a blast, and I'm uh, able to live my 30s for decade after decade after decade. <laughs> and uh, it's fun feeling the way I feel and thinking the way I think. And this is the final thing why I do it. I'm able to talk to you folks. How many 70-year-old people look at you folks like a 30-year-old and has a great chat like this? And I have all the experience and background in order to convey information that's interesting. So you come out and you listen to what I'm here to, what, I'm, what I have to say to you. Do you think I'd have interesting things to say if I didn't do all of this stuff? I'd be slow. You, you, you lose a step when you age normally. And, uh, and you don't have the energy to, to sort of push on and go through things like this. And uh, that's normal for people. That's, what, that's normal for the genetic lifespan of a human being. So for me to mess with it, you have to say, what did I gain from it? I gained personally myself a lot of fun. So yeah, this is a big extraterrestrial battle. This is a huge war that's going on. This is a prison planet within a galactic, con galactic setting that has experienced a Holocaust over the last million years. Uh, this is a lot of stuff that's going on and humanity is really in the dark ages, but it's being liberated slowly, slowly, slowly. And I wanted to be a part of changing the way this planet works and thus I also have a vision also that when humanity is released out there into the galaxy again this is the highest concentration of creatives that has ever existed in this galaxy that's what our research suggests and when you have those people all having a similar human experience going out humans from earth are going to be legendary legendary I mean this is fun to be able to be on the cutting edge of stuff like this Okay, the last thing I'm going to say is we have really unusual things happening in July and August. Um, you know how we announce our mysteries projects at the end of every month and then two weeks later our mysteries projects come out? What you're going to be seeing this July and August is so out there that we're not going to announce it in advance. We're just going to let it happen. So you're going to be seeing stuff that will... <laughs> <laughs> blow your mind, whatever you want to call it, it's going to be absolutely astounding. Anyway, um, July and August, expect the most amazing stuff you've ever seen to come out from Farsight. The only difference is we're not going to be announcing it in advance. 
we're just going to let it hit. Now the next Mysteries Project, however, is out in just a few days, um, and that's we answered the question of how the reptilians actually got to the galaxy in the first place, how they got here. So uh, that was a real interesting question for us, like, okay, so the reptilians have sort of a attitude, there's sort of a thing about them, like, where did they come from? Did they actually grow up naturally, evolving on the planet someplace? Or? So we answered the question of where they came from. And it's a fascinating story, and you are going to see it firsthand in just a few days. All right, so you've been really great. We've had a great turnout today, and this intelligence briefing has been fun. Uh, I'm having a blast. I'm having a lots of fun for in my in my life, and I'm hoping that is infectious and contagious. And I hope you don't mind me sort of sharing with you all of the details of uh, health stuff. I think it's sort of been fun and exciting. I actually have enjoyed the whole thing and even working with the doctors and telling them my situation and having them go through my records and saying, hmm, okay, we have a different situation. We have to treat you differently. How are we going to deal with this? That's been always sort of an adventure for me. And it was really hilarious when I went to the plastic surgeons and I I said, this is the situation. I'm going to live a long, long time and you got to fix this thing. This making me look like a, like a, like a, like a, a famine victim, this thing I'm doing, but you got to make it, I got to look good again. And so seeing them go through that process, they had to really think hard about how to fix things. <laughs> that was fun. Actually, they got into it after a while. They're really great. So, uh, yeah, Dr. Muto and Dr. Eves of uh, ME Plastic Surgery up here in Atlanta, they have been, uh, they may be the only plastic surgeons on the planet that are now familiar with how to deal with people like me. I don't, they have, they don't have any other people like me, but uh, I don't know of any other plastic surgeons that have dealt with just this type of thing, how to fix the issues that are relate with uh, this type of anti-aging process. Anyway, you guys have been great. I want to thank you so much for being here. And the next intelligence briefing will be in July. And in July, you're also going to see stuff that is going to be more amazing than you can imagine. And I absolutely can't tell you what it's going to be. I will explain why all the secrecy in September after it's all over. But uh, you're just going to have to be surprised. But anyway, in a few days, you're going to see where the reptilians came from, and that's going to be a blockbuster, and that'll happen just in a few days. I want to thank you all for being here. You've been a great set of guests, and uh, I am going to see you again next month, and you will see me also when the new Mysteries Project comes out in just a few days. Thanks, guys. You're the best, and I mean guys generically, men and women, so you're, you're, you're all the best, all right, and uh, see you soon.